Are you torn between sticking with your trusty Sony ZV-E10 or upgrading to the A6700? I've heavily used both of those cameras and I'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison on the main differences that might make your decision a whole lot easier. Stick around. Before we talk about the main differences, let's make sure we're on the same page with some important similarities. First thing, they're both APS-C crop sensor cameras, and they both record video in 4K 24 and 4K 30 frames per second. They also both do not have a record limit for video, and they have a fully articulating touch screen. And that's about it, so let's jump into those main differences. The first thing is the cost. The ZV-E10 coming in at just under $600 for the camera body only, and the A6700 coming in at $1,400 also for the camera body only. So I guess the main question we have to ask is simply, does the A6700 have enough to justify that additional about an $800 cost difference? The ZV-E10 records in 4K 24 and 4K 30, but the A6700 bumps that up a bit. We're going 4K 24, 4K 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. The ZV-E10 is recording in 8-bit color, and the A6700 bumps that up to 10-bit color, which if you're wondering what that means, if you look down below here, if you look at the sun, you can see the gradient is a lot more smooth and you're getting 10-bit color. It's a huge upgrade, a big one that I noticed after using 8-bit cameras and bumping up to 10-bit. And with that 10-bit color, the A6700 has S-Log3. The ZV-E10 has S-Log3 too, but you can't really get the most out of S-Log3 until you're using 10-bit color. And it also gives us S-Cinetone picture profile, which is a highly desirable picture profile that's usually reserved for the higher-end cinema cameras for Sony, but you're starting to see them a lot more in these consumer level cameras. Looking at low light, the ZV-E10 gives us a regular ISO and it's pretty weak for low light performance, but the A6700 gives us what's called a dual native ISO, or at least it's mimicking that. There's some algorithms working to reduce noise, which essentially gives us a really strong performer as far as APS-C cameras go to do a lot better in low light. And in the A6700, we're getting the ability to install user LUTs, which the ZV-E10 doesn't give us. It's a pretty cool feature that allows us to install our own LUTs on the camera and look at what the footage would look like with whatever LUT we want to install on the camera so that we don't have to do that just in post. We can see that before we even hit record. And the color science. The ZV-E10 is doing some of the older Sony color science where the A6700 gives us an update. Sony made a big jump around the FX3 time. I first noticed it in the ZV-E1, but the A6700 also has this newer color science that I think is a lot more flattering. I've used the ZV-E10 heavily and the colors are fine and they're good, but the A6700 certainly gives us an upgrade in regards to the color science. And you're actually looking at all that right now. We're recording this video in S-Log3 in 10-bit color using this newer color science with the A6700. Codex, the ZV-E10, we get XAVC-S, and we get some upgrades in the A6700 with XAVC-S. We're also getting XAVC-SI, which is an all intra recording, really, really high quality, uh, also massive file sizes, and it also gives us XAVC-HS, which is an H.265 file type, which you can only use if your computer can support that. Most of the newer MacBooks can. And that file type is really nice because it's a lot smaller than SI, but has a really high quality. It's my preferred and go-to codec using these newer cameras. And for live streaming, both cameras have the ability to put in a USB-C connected directly to your computer, and that's all you have to do. No third-party softwares to activate it on like a Zoom call or any streaming software. You just connect it to your computer, and that's your webcam, which is nice. But the ZV-E10, the max record we can do for streaming is 720 at 30p, and the A6700 bumps it up a notch here. We're getting 4K 30, and that footage looks really nice. Packaging that all together, what does that actually mean? The A6700 is giving us a pretty big upgrade when it comes to video quality. Better low light, better color, more codecs, better frame rates, and some ancillary things like the desirable s Cinetone picture profile, as well as the ability to install user LUTs. Although we have a few more things to dive into that are gonna help you make a decision, those upgrades for me are alone to justify that $800 cost difference because the video quality is much higher, the production I'm able to do is much higher, and the workflows are much smoother. If you're getting something from this video or you're looking forward to the breakdown we're about to do on some other features between these two cameras, let me know by giving it a tap on the thumbs up. And while you're down there, I'm really curious to know, 
Do you have the ZV E10? Are you thinking about getting the A6700? What are you shooting? What's on your mind? Let me know in the comments. I'll be checking those out. Moving into the photo features, the ZV E10, we're getting a 24.2 megapixel sensor and the A6700, we're getting a small upgrade here of 26 megapixels. It's a negligible difference. I don't think a lot of us are gonna notice that, but it technically is an upgrade in the resolution for our photos. They're also both being able to do burst photos at 11 frames per second, and we're also getting raw and JPEG out of both of these cameras. I guess they're pretty similar for photography, but they do have some large differences when it comes to autofocus, in-camera stabilization, and some other features that really could play a role in the overall photo quality that you're getting. More on that right now. The autofocus, and then we'll get into some other features in a second, but the autofocus, the ZV-E10 does have eye autofocus. We get real-time tracking, so subject tracking across the frame. It has 425 phase detection auto points, which covers 84% of the sensor or of the frame, which you can see an example of what that is over there. And then take note of that, when we shift over to the A6700, I'm gonna start at the bottom, we get 759 phase detection points with 93% coverage. So we're able to get a lot more space of the sensor and of the frame that we're using for autofocus. And that A6700 does also have the eye autofocus and the real-time tracking, just like the ZV-E10. But where it gets a little bit interesting with the autofocus is this AI chip that's in the A6700. It's not something that the ZV-E10 has. What that gives us and the AI when it comes to particularly to autofocus, we're getting Sony's best, latest and greatest autofocus where it's really good at tracking a subject even when other people or other subjects come in front of that subject or behind it or beside it, you can track it really seamlessly with this AI. So it's, it's a pretty big upgrade on an already really solid autofocus performing system that Sony provides. And with that AI, we get brand new subject recognition options. We're able to track people, animals, insects, birds, trains, planes. It has a ton of different subject recognitions that we can choose from, which which can be really beneficial depending upon what you're shooting. That AI also gives us auto cropping, which is a feature I didn't really know I needed until I first had access to it. But what it does is it's gonna just crop in on the sensor, it's gonna track a subject, it's gonna give you a look as if you have a second person that's actually filming you, which is a really nice feature and a nice angle if you're a solo creator. The stabilization, this is a big one. The ZV-E10 doesn't have IBIS, in-body image stabilization. So no in-camera stabilization, but the A6700 does give us five stops of active stabilization, which can come in handy for vlog style shots or anything handheld. You're gonna get a little bit more smooth footage using the A6700. It's also the menu system. We have the E10, which has the older Sony menu system, which it's not my favorite. It's not really popular amongst a lot of creators out there. It's, it's a little bit cumbersome but the A6700 does give us the new menu system, which is a huge upgrade. If you haven't used it yet, you'll notice a big difference once you get in there. Camera body, we have a few points to make here. The first one, the hot shoe. On the ZV-E10, it's not much of a hot shoe. We have a mount on top of the camera to put a microphone on, but it does need a cable connected to the 3.5 millimeter audio jack in the camera to be able to get audio. Not a huge deal, but on the A6700 with the newer Sony microphones, we have this new digital interface for the hot shoe, which provides us the ability to put in the newer Sony microphones with no cable needed to connect to the actual camera. And even with that, we're actually getting the ability to do four channel audio recording, which can have some nice features to it and allow for some additional safety tracks and some other nice features when it comes to audio. On the ZV-E10, there is no electronic viewfinder. On the A6700, it does have one. It's not wonderful, but it does the job. Really comes in handy for those bright days when you're trying to nail focus and you can't see the back of your screen that well because it's too bright, the EVF is clutch. The grip, so on the ZV-E10, it's small and feels a little bit cheap, but on the A6700, we're getting a much more substantial, robust, and high quality grip, which feels a lot better in your hand. And with that new grip, we're also getting a brand new battery. On the A6700, we have the larger Sony NPFZ battery, which with constant video recording, we're getting over two hours. On the ZV-E10, we have the NPFW50. It's really not that bad. It's smaller, it's, they do a good job in the ZV-E10, 
but it's recording at about 100 minutes of continuous shooting, all this in 4K, 24 frames a second. So it's an upgrade on the battery with the A6700. Dials, so the actual camera body dials on the ZV-E10, this is huge for your workflows and efficiency and changing settings. On the ZV-E10, we have one wheel, one dial, and minimal custom buttons. But on the A6700, we have that same one wheel. We have two dials, one in the back and one in the front, usually for shutter speed and aperture. And then we have a ton of different custom buttons that we can utilize. And it just has generally much more pro features on the camera body when it comes to dials. The hybrid toggle. Technically, both these cameras are hybrid, meaning they shoot photos well and videos well. On the ZV-E10, there's a switch. We can toggle between photo, video, and S and Q. That's really all we get. We have to go into the menu and change certain settings from there. But on the A6700, we have a hybrid toggle, which we can switch for photo, video, and S and Q, albeit a little bit different than how the ZV-E10 is laid out. But we're also getting a dial up top where we can quickly toggle between our memory recall settings or our presets like manual mode, aperture priority, or shutter priority, and all the other ones that are up there. Generally, it's just much faster for your workflows on toggling for hybrid options. And then the camera screen when it comes to touch. On the ZV-E10, it's pretty limited. It does have a touch screen. We can touch the track and that's great. But on the A6700, we also get touch to track, but we can also change the settings via touch, which is really useful when you're doing a vlog style shot and you wanna change something like your ISO or your aperture or your shutter speed. You can just do that by tapping the menu and not having to guess from behind the camera what dial you're hitting and what direction it's going. There is a potential deal breaker though. As good as the A6700 is sounding, it might be a deal breaker for you if you're in this exact situation when it comes to overheating. The ZV-E10 in 4K, 24P in a controlled climate, we can get two hours plus of recording with like no warning. The camera might shut down because the battery dies, but I've had a really hard time ever getting the ZV-E10 to overheat. But unfortunately on the A6700 in that same controlled climate in 4K24, at about 90 minutes, you might get the camera to overheat. I do think that 90 minutes is plenty of record time for 90% of us out there, but if you're doing a long format style video podcast, that's over 90 minutes, or anywhere close to 90 minutes, I'd say you're gonna have a lot more confidence sticking with your Sony ZV-E10. But if you want a significant upgrade in the video quality and you're looking to upgrade from the E10 and you're doing that long format style video work, I would say the FX30 is a fantastic camera to look into. So with that, who should upgrade and, and who shouldn't? Look, if you're using the Sony ZV-E10 and you don't need to record in frame rates outside of 4K 24, 4K 30, like you don't need 4K 60 or 4K 120 for high resolution slow motion, and you're just generally happy with the way your colors look and you like your workflows with it, I wouldn't upgrade to the A6700. And who should consider upgrading? Anybody who's looking for more pro level features, maybe you've outgrown your ZV-E10 a little bit and you want things like 4K 120 or 4K 60 for slow motion, or you want the ability to look at user LUTs in camera, maybe you want better low light performance, or maybe you don't love the way your colors and tones are looking out of the ZV-E10. You might really benefit from something like 10-bit color or using a Cinetone. And of course, the updated color science isn't gonna hurt with how the videos look either. I think the A6700 absolutely makes up that $800 price difference between the Sony ZV-E10. We're getting better video quality in almost every single aspect. And although the photos are relatively similar, the upgrades that we get when it comes to autofocus, the AI chip, and all the things that it brings is pretty vast. And I'd argue that the A6700 is the most value-packed and feature-rich camera that's on the market right now in the sub $2,000 category. If you wanna know more details about how good the A6700 is, as well as a couple of downfalls, you wanna check out this video where I give it a complete breakdown and full review. Anyways, I'll see you in the next video. Take care. See ya.